Live from New Hampshire, it's time for the Science Cafe! Learn about the latest technologic innovations today. And you don't have to pay. Expert panels with advanced degrees are sure to satisfy your curiosity. Can we mention it's free? And if you think you'll find a better time than this, then come on down and test your hypothesis. Cause you're gonna learn a lot if you wanna stay. Down at the Science Cafe. Good evening and welcome to another virtual Science Cafe in New Hampshire, where the beers cost less, but the service varies. My name is Dan Marchek, and once again we're proud to offer Science Cafe, a forum for public discourse guided by science and a panel of experts. Your questions are critical to the conversation, so please send them in via the comments field in Facebook Live or YouTube. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Sarah Eck, co-founder of Science Cafe in New Hampshire. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, when Dan and I first met to discuss our dreams and visions of Science Cafe, we had hoped that it would spread across the state. And indeed, we now have expanded our efforts to the Nashua area. And there is a Science Cafe on the seacoast in Portsmouth, in Manchester, and also in the Upper Valley. Um, now we've moved to the online venue, which uh, may be more accessible to even more residents of New Hampshire. Please uh, feel free to submit questions or comments through the comment fields, both on Facebook and YouTube. And I'd like to introduce you next to our original moderator, David Brooks. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I'm Dave Brooks with the Concord Monitor, and I was a moderator back when Dan and Sarah started this uh, more than nine years ago. And over that period, we have covered a ton of topics, uh, ranging from climate change, vaccinations, telemedicine, Lyme disease, uh, the politics, uh, I'm sorry, the mathematics of political polling, which was particularly geeky, and uh, a variety of topics, but tonight's is, is a little bit different. Uh, it's music therapy, which when I first heard it, I thought it sounded kind of touchy-feely, but it's actually quite interesting. There's a lot of real science in here, uh, neurobiology and neuroscience, trying to figure out exactly why this strange thing called music affects us the way it does and how we can use it to sort of cope with these trying times. So sit back, um, enjoy your own beer at home and uh, listen as we head into Science Cafe. And here is tonight's moderator, Rick Irving. Hello, my name is Rick Irving and I am the moderator for Science Cafe. Welcome to our panel and our audience. July 2020 Science Cafe's topic is music therapy. Uh, now we normally would meet these, uh, would have these sessions in a cafe, a little restaurant in Nashua, the Riverside Cafe, but the coronavirus has forced us to adopt and therefore we have evolved into a virtual session. So it would be completely irresponsible for us to try and get everybody together. So everybody you will see here tonight is completely separate uh, places, probably all at our homes. Uh, one of the things that that has benefited uh, for us is that we have more access to not only panelists, but more access to audiences. So the audience, for example, two of our panelists tonight do not have to travel an hour, an hour and a half down from where they lived out to Nashua to be here, and neither do the two folks from Boston have to travel up here. Uh, in terms of the audience, it is growing in scale, and in New Hampshire or Nashua, we've had a pretty good following, but now with the virtual uh, sessions, we are Last week we had, last month we had people from New York, quite a few from California, Texas, Florida. And for the first time we had somebody from Queensland, Australia uh, viewing our session. So if our friend from Queensland is there, uh, welcome back. We'd love to see you. The format for this evening for all of Science Cafes is uh, very similar. I will briefly introduce the panel and then um, ask the panel to introduce themselves and give us more about their background, how they got into music therapy and um, some of what they do on a daily basis. Um, and then after that, we're gonna go right into a question and answer session because the audience and the panelists really drive how this session goes. So your questions from the audience are, are very important to uh, 
having the exchange of information that we value. We're trying to get some education as well some, as some thought exchange here. And that's really why the Science Cafe exists. So you may start asking your questions anytime. We would appreciate it if you would keep them somewhat succinct. Um, but if you're on YouTube or uh, Facebook, I think if you go to the comment sections, you can go ahead and submit them now. And we will have people taking a look at them and triaging them for us. Once we are done with the Q&A, and I should say we hope to get to all the questions, but sometimes time will not permit us to do that. Um, so we apologize in advance if that happens. We'll have some final announcements and then we will be done. So with that, let's get right into the heart of the matter. And our panelists, um, we have Elizabeth Ferguson, who is a board certified musical therapist. She is the owner and founder of the Granite State Music Therapy Company. And she has been practicing there for 10 years. So thank you very much for participating, Elizabeth. We also have Marissa Scott, who is another board certified music therapist, the owner and director of the Sotina Center uh, in Dover, New Hampshire. She founded that in 2011. So both of these ladies are pioneers in this area and we appreciate your being here. Mm -hmm. We have two more panelists, Psyche Louis, a PhD in psychology from Berkeley who is the Assistant Professor of Creativity and Creative Practice in the Department of Music at Northeastern University in Boston, my alma mater. Mm -hmm. And we have Arunda Patel, a PhD in psychology from Harvard, who is currently the Professor of Psychology at Tufts University in the Boston area. He has also served as the President of the Society for Music, Perception and Cognition. And he has authored a book in his past called Music, Language, and the Brain. So we have a very qualified uh, set of panelists, very accomplished set of panelists, and we appreciate you being here. Thanks for your time. So uh, we'll just go ahead and go in that order and have you say a little bit about yourself. So Elizabeth, if you would go first, tell us about how you got here, or what you do, and please take some time to brag about Granite State Music Therapy. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Um, so as Rick said, I'm Elizabeth Ferguson and I own Granite State Music Therapy. Um, we provide services um, all ages and abilities. Um, we have early intervention as young as eight months old and our oldest client um, in memory care at a rehab hospital, I think is over 100 years old. Um, so we really do serve a wide range of individuals. Um, and I got into music therapy um, by going to school for music therapy. I have my bachelor's in music therapy from Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. Um, and when I came home, I, I had the longest waiting list. So I knew I needed to grow and um, work with other certified therapists to serve throughout New Hampshire. And I'm very grateful for my work and I love what I do. Great, thank you. Marissa, uh, tell us about yourself. And again, feel free to brag about the uh, Santina Center. <laughs> sure, thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, so I, my name is Marissa Scott and I am the owner of the Santina Center for Creative Arts Therapy. Um, we are kind of a multimodal creative arts therapy center. So we have um, several music therapists on staff and we also have an art therapist. Um, and we also serve all ages. So I personally work with infants and toddlers and parents um, who are expecting. Um, and then many people on our team are working with adults and teens, um, all abilities and really all different reasons. Um, kind of everyone on our team has a different specialization for uh, treatment. So we, uh, we see people all over New Hampshire and a little bit in Southern Maine as well. Um, but we have a center that's located in Dover, New Hampshire. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great, um, thank you. Um, Psyche, I mean, all these people have very deep backgrounds in music, by the way, uh, as does Psyche Lloyd. Could you please tell us about yourself and what you're up to at Northeastern? Great, um, sure. 
I am not a music therapist, but I would identify as a neuroscientist who studies music and is trying to understand music therapy right now. Um, so maybe I should start with when I was 16, I grew up in, in Vancouver, Canada, uh, and I've played piano and violin for many years. Uh, and I started to, to um, volunteer in a nursing home in Vancouver. Um, and at the time, there wasn't really uh, an agenda for, for what I should do. Um, and, but I did see that there was a piano uh, in the cafeteria in the nursing home, and I started playing it. And it was really remarkable how there were some, um, some residents of the nursing home um, who were quite in, in quite late stage dementia. They could, for example, not, not remember who, um, you know, who they were talking to. Um, but then when they heard music, they would really suddenly start singing along, um, remembering all the words, not only singing the melody, but harmonizing to the melody. So some pretty sophisticated uh, music and the brain um, going processes going on. Um, so I went to undergrad to um, to study um, medicine, actually. Um, but then I started realizing that um, there is this emerging field of music perception and cognition, and that the tools of neuroscience might be one way of quite objectively trying to address these seemingly subjective questions or of why does music make you feel the way that you do or, or how can music help? Um, so I ended up going to grad school uh, in UC Berkeley um, and now I'm at, I have my lab, it's called the MIND lab where MIND stands for Music, Imaging and Neurodynamics um, and it's at Northeastern University and one of, uh, I would say a few of our projects um, really trying to understand uh, music therapy and how that works in the brain. Um, so I. I work with music therapists, um, and you know, and, and we're trying to understand um, how that works. Excellent, thank you, Ani Rood. The same questions for you. Hi, uh, I'm Ani Patel. I am in the psychology department at Tufts University, though I um, actually my PhD is in biology, and I'm trained. Uh, all my degrees are in biology, but I'm basically a a biologist who got really fascinated with music early on because just of a personal deep response to music and love of music. I don't have any degrees in music. I'm not a professional musician. Um, but I, in college, I kind of started thinking about what behavior do I want to study as a biologist? What do I want to unpack? And um, these two things that had lived in completely different parts of my brain, the love of biology and the love of music, because fused one day and uh, in kind of an aha moment. And I thought, wow, maybe I can use the tools of biology, you know, spanning neuroscience, evolutionary biology, and so on, uh, to study music. And so that kind of launched me down the path that I'm on now. Um, some of the main questions I've been focusing on are um, how is music related to language in the brain, even though they seem very different superficially? Do they have kind of hidden connections in the brain that'll help us understand their relationship and how we can use music to help people with language disorders? Um, I study a lot about rhythm and our sense of rhythm and beat um, and, and how that's connected to movement uh, in behavior and in the brain. And I'm interested in evolutionary questions. Why are we musical? Where did music come from in evolution? And I study that by looking at how other animals respond to music, get clues about how our sense of rhythm and evolved, uh, including the question of whether other animals find music soothing. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Glad to be here. Okay, thank you. That's excellent. So we are off and running and we have our first question already. Can the deaf utilize music therapy uh, by feeling the vibrations? If so, does it differ from the hearing patient in regards to the brain? Well, it's a kind of two-part question, I guess. Uh, probably the therapist should tackle the therapy part. <laughs> Oh, yes, so do we okay. just jump in? <laughs> sure, jump in. I'd love to. Um, so I would say definitely yes. Um, when I was an intern working for the Manchester Community Music School, I had um, part of my work was at um, here in New Hampshire, H E A R, um, which is currently non-existent it had combined with another organization but um i worked in their inclusive pre-k pre and kindergarten classrooms where we would go and work with the kids and we would use big vibrations um, and sound and one of the things that i would do with kids um would be um we would have them uh using voc voice 
um, in a mic or, or, or making sound with instruments into a microphone that was connected to GarageBand. Um, and they could visually see the sound wave. Um, and so it was more of a visual reference representation of sound. Um, and, you know, if they make a stronger bang on the drum or if they use more force with their vocal cords, the sound wave would be bigger. Um, so we would kind of like explore those types of things. I mean, I think we could talk a lot about the neuroscience of how the brain combines sound and other um, other modalities, right? I mean, it's you'd think that intuitively music starts with sound, but but we actually use a lot of other um, senses to experience music. Um, there was a really striking study uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Um, looking at, it's not music therapy per se, but it's looking at expert music performances, um, right? So uh, they were looking at uh, these um, music perform musicians who were competing um, in professional music competitions. Um, they were all pianists and it turns out, uh, so, um, the, so I think the research participants were asked to, um, to guess based on a few videos of uh, these performances um, who actually won the competition. Um, and it turns out that most, um, it turns out that people were using the, the visual information rather than the sound information um, to make that decision. So if you only watched the video of somebody playing piano, you were actually more likely to guess who won the competition compared to if you just heard them, um, just the sound that they made. Um, so that's just underlining how how much we really integrate visual information into our musical experience. Um, you know, to, for the question of whether it's different in the brain, I'm pretty sure it does differ. Um, we have looked at um, you know, people with different um, levels of training and people with different senses um, or using different, different senses. Of course, you would get more auditory activity um, if you are getting auditory stimulation. Um, but that said, um, there's some really, really um, convincing evidence now that um, for, for the blind, for people who are blind, for example, uh, when they are listening to music, they actually activate their visual system, right? So, so you can substitute um, your, your senses in your brain in a, in a way. So I think that um, this integration probably doesn't affect maybe the primary sensory parts of the brain, but maybe more late, um, late in the in the stream of processing in the brain, um, we, we would see a lot more integration. Yeah, I agree. I think Psyche touched on something very important, which is um, there's big parts of our brain are uh, devoted to integrating different senses. And I think in terms of music, the feeling of uh, tactile sensations from deep bass that you get, like when you're at a concert and you really hear the bass, people love that. And it's tactile, but it's being integrated with the auditory sense. And I think it gives you a lot of pleasure. Um, to the extent that we're willing to tolerate ridiculously loud sounds at concerts and think that that's okay. Um, so it, it always strikes me because if you take the analogy, imagine you went to concerts and part of what concerts did was f flash blindingly bright lights at you all through the concert to the point where it was painful, you couldn't see after the concert and you gradually lost your vision. We would probably think that was uncool, but we're willing to go to concerts where you people play definitely loud sounds and you can't really hear well after the concert and research shows that you actually are losing hearing permanently after every experience like that. And eventually you lose your hearing, or get tinnitus and all kinds of things, but we don't seem to object. We put in earplugs, which may not even work that well, but uh, we think that's okay. And I think one reason we think that's okay is that we love the tactile sensation and that gets integrated with our auditory sensation and that gives us a lot of pleasure. Wow, great, thank you. Um, the next question for interesting as well. For what conditions or treatments is it better to play music for the patient or have them play or compose music? So I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I guess it, it can be specific to a diagnosis. Um, I think it's specific to the person. Everything we do as a music therapist is um, it's individualized to each client or each group that we're working on or working with. Um, so we might passively put on music um, 
to help with agitation on a level where the patient might not be able to actively participate, but passively they will hear the music and music is so sequential, it might help um, to lessen their agitation to help ground them. Um, but that's not to say that later that day that patient might want to engage in music socially um, where they would be playing an instrument at, with a group um, and that's a different goal. So I, I think it, it's, it's all individualized um, and I don't think one is better or, than the other for specific diagnoses. Yeah, I think that um, in my lab, we're trying to understand receptive music therapy or receptive music-based intervention in older adults with mild cognitive impairment. Um, and I think that with some groups, right, if there's, um, if the main concern is uh, about uh, mood or decrease of agita decrease in agitation, um, then receptive uh, might be helpful. But for example, for stroke patients, I used to work in a, a neurology um, where uh, we were working with, uh, with patients who were recovering from a stroke. Um, and for them, if the main goal is to try to get, for example, for them to move their arms in a certain way, um, then there are some really um, cool, I think, techniques of, um, of movement sonification. Right? So, so you try to map um, a, a client's arm movement to sound, and that experience is as rewarding for for the participants, and then that that rewards them to make more movement. So, so something like that, which is much more um, more towards the active side, might be um, might be helpful. So, I totally agree. It it really depends on on what the therapeutic goal is. Right, I'll just point out quickly that there's a therapy for uh, stroke victims that suffer from uh, problems producing language after uh, brain damage, so non-fluent aphasia. Uh, this is a therapy based on a musical kind of uh, utterance called uh, melodic intonation therapy, and actually Psyche was involved in some of this research, um, and it can help people recover language after stroke that impairs their language, um, and it's very much an active, it's not just listening, it's repeating and intoning and and uh, kind of singing these phrases in a way that seems to recruit um, parts of the brain that normally are involved in singing, but retrain them, take over some of the lost speech functions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see. We know that people like different types of music. Some people may be soothed by classical music, some by heavy metal. How do the therapists use their preferences to treat these folks? As far as the science is concerned, do they work differently in different parts of the brain? Um, <clears throat> preference is so huge. It's such a huge part of what we do as music therapists um, because music, I think, can be really powerful for many people, but um, in, the, in the positive sense of powerful, there's also, um, it can also be, it can also have some negative effects. So um, choosing music that is preferential to your individual client is one of the things that we're, um, we're really trained to watch out for, to recognize signs of um, overstimulation in our clients um, as, you know, infants as young as, um, you know, pre premature infants. Um, that are just, you know, hours old, um, have a reflex uh, that they could put up called a halt hand when they are overstimulated. And so, you know, that's part of our, of our training is knowing how to recognize signs of overstimulation and knowing that when a client can't verbalize um, their music preferences, what to look for in the body as um, this isn't this is having a negative effect on the client and, and immediately stopping the music um, and changing what we're doing. Um, but for those that can be verbal, um, you know, exploring what their music preferences are. Um, and then the other important thing is if you're working with clients who have any type of trauma, um, there can be music that could trigger trauma. And so um, making sure that you're having, um, important conversations and being really aware of, of all of your clients' um, contextual background and, and history 
Um, and just knowing all of that is a big part. I can okay. talk a little bit about the um, the neuroscience part. Um, so I would say that um, I don't think of it as my job to 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 find out what different how different pieces of music activate different parts of the brain. Um, but I think because I, I think it's not so much about certain pieces of music, um, but I think it's about an interaction between your experience and the sounds. Right. So by that I mean that what training you've had, what background you come from, what you listen to throughout your life, um, you know, what your, your exposure from infancy um, really uh, is something that you bring to bear when you're interpreting musical sounds. Um, so in my lab, we've done some work looking at jazz trained musicians, so improv musicians uh, and classical trained musicians. Um, and we had them listen to the same few chord progressions. Um, some were very expected chord progressions like C major chord progressions that end in C major. Uh, some were slightly unexpected chord progressions like C majors that, that C major chord progression that changes a little bit and then goes back to C and then some were very unexpected. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, while, um, while everybody, right, regardless of musical training does notice unexpectedness uh, at some point. The jazz musicians um, actually realized, noticed that difference earlier. So they were more sensitive to the unexpectedness. Um, and then the classical musicians were still sensitive to that unexpectedness a little bit later on. So this is all happening very quickly within one second or so. Um, but around 200 milliseconds, you see jazz musicians really starting to notice. And then around 800 milliseconds, the jazz musicians have actually forgotten, right? They, they actually go back to baseline, whereas the classical musicians are still over-processing um, that unexpectedness. So I think it, it kind of goes into um, the stereotype of how we think about classical musicians and jazz musicians, right? The jazz musicians are very um, sensitive to unexpectedness, and then they also are more open to unexpectedness, whereas the classical musicians might be um, kind of over-processing or maybe even thinking of unexpected um, sounds as a, as a mistake. Um, so these kinds of, I mean, it's, again, it's not so much how different songs activate different parts of the brain, but it's much more about how, uh, about what experience you bring to your experience of musical sounds. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, we have next question from Facebook. What is the difference between music therapy and therapeutic music? That's a good one. I'll jump in. <laughs> sure. yeah. um, that's an awesome question because in New Hampshire, we have a lot of um, certified therapeutic musicians and we also have a lot of board certified music therapists and they're two totally different professions. Um, both are trained musicians and both use music therapy, ther therapeutically, but they're very different professions. Um, so that's a great question. Um, I would say the biggest, the biggest difference basically is that um, therapeutic musicians use, they use elements of music um, that they know are um, researched to lower heart rate and be generally considered relaxing, um, not overstimulating those types of um, kind of you know, ther therapeutic in the sense that you would you would want calming and um, there a lot of certified therapeutic musicians work in hospitals um, and then board certified music therapists, which is um, like myself and Elizabeth. Um, the biggest difference is the therapeutic relationship. So we are looking at an individual and creating individualized goals and treatment plans for one person. And so we are also using, um, you know, the different elements of music, um, but it's really specific to that one person. Um, and we're, we're building that therapeutic relationship in the, in the therapy process. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, do you have anything else to add to that? Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm not really sure about therapeutic musicians, um, but just that everything that we are doing as a music therapist is individualized. I agree we, you know, it's all evidence-based practice. Um, and our, our goals, I'm assuming 
are more specific um, from what it sounds like, but I'm, I'm not sure about um, therapeutic musicians. Like I've, I've actually had, so I, I've taught a course called Music Perception and Cognition for many years. And sometimes I have students come into my classroom that they say that they do music therapy. And it took me a while. Um, at first, I, I just let it slide. But after a while, now I say, well, you're not really doing music therapy because if you were doing music, you, you'd have to be licensed as an MT. Or, and I mean, I think you, you might find music to be therapeutic. That's quite different from, um, from receiving music therapy. Right. I think music therapy is much more you're, you're working with um, a, a music therapist, a licensed or certified music therapist, whereas listening to therapeutic music can be um, more general, I, I suppose. I mean, would you would you guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I always like to visualize this um, image of a triangle for music therapy where one point is um, the one point is the. <laughs> the music therapist and one point is the client um, and the other the third point is the is the um, therapeutic relationship and you really can't have music therapy is kind of in the middle of the triangle and you can't have the music therapy if you don't have a, a music ther a therapeutic relationship um, you can use music in a way that is therapeutic um, in the sense that it's calming or um, you know, relaxing or, you know, purposeful, but it's not technically music therapy if you don't have that therapeutic relationship um, with a board certified therapist. Oh, okay, thank you. So we've got some fascinating questions in the queue here. Tom and Lynn Bloomquist are asking, please address using different music frequencies to alter brainwave frequencies as an aid to hypnosis or meditative states. That one's got psyche written all over it. <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it does. Um, I think when it comes to hypnosis, I mean, yeah, well, there's there's Mike Hove at um, Pittsburgh State who might say even more about that. Um, I mean, I think that w what we can say is that when you're listening to music that you enjoy, that you're engaged in, it engages your brain in that your brain potentials and your firings of your um, of your your brain rhythms align or synchronize with uh, with the sound waves, right, or with the en energy changes that are in the sound. Um, so this is a, a process known as entrainment, right? So the, the alignment of um, of brain potentials with uh, with sound. How is that is that used for hypnosis? Um, I don't think that's so well studied or so, so well understood. Um, I do know that, and this is my host research, um, uh, I do know that shamanic uh, or shamans across different cultures tend to use some low frequency um, drum beats in the, in, in the music that they make. Um, you know, whether that means that that's uh, some kind of, I mean, I don't think there's something magical about, uh, about that rhythm. It's, uh, it's usually around four hertz. Um, but I don't think that there's anything magical about four hertz enough that if I just played you something at four hertz, so you would automatically go into a hypnotic state. And so I think there's a lot more additional um, environmental factors associated with that. Um, that said, I, I do think that you know this question does get to a lot of the the answers that we don't have yet. And and I I'm one of the sort of more optimistic people about uh, about music and music therapy um, where. You know, the question might be, what can it do, right? There, there might be lots of um, music that we haven't composed yet, um, that if we compose that music using knowledge about neuroscience and, and how the brain works, uh, we might be able to, to design more therapeutic types of music. Um, and so I, I've, I've been working with some um, startup companies that are trying to achieve that goal. So one of them is Brain.fm. Um, they're trying to make music that helps you focus uh, and also helps you relax by tuning to different frequencies of, uh, of your brain oscillations. Um, and then another startup company that I'm working with um, is Synchrony. Um, and it's called Oscilloscape. Um, Synchrony is their product. And, and this is uh, started by, founded by neuroscientists at large Edward Large, who is um, Ani and I both know, um, and he's a professor at UConn who has worked on um, neural network models that 
uh, and train to rhythm. So it, it's it's a computer model that can listen to sounds, to, to musical sounds and detect the beat, right? And so what, what he's done is map that computer model onto lights. And so he's now got lights that, that are, so imagine Christmas lights that are breathing to the music, right? They're, they're blinking and changing color um, with, with the downbeat. Um, so now we're trying to see whether we can use that technology and couple it with some some more uh, more information that we're finding out with the neuroscience about um, brain rhythms and try to use that as a way to create some new interventions for people um, with different stages of mild cognitive impairment. So so I think it's um it's very um, new still. So we don't have too much evidence for it, but I think. Um, we know enough about how the, the brain oscillates um, with music that we can start to try to define some new interventions for it. Great. Okay, Rachel Guetta say, asks, are there differential effects and or treatment outcomes of music therapy on individuals mm -hmm. with or without musical anhedonia? Rachel Guetta, hello, Rachel. She was a Rachel's thesis a plant. Re, uh, Rachel did her thesis with me at Wesleyan a few <laughs> couple of years ago. Is uh, a plant? I didn't plan her, but uh, I somehow <laughs> found out about this. So hi. I feel like I would defer to the neurologist for this question. I I would think that if there's no musical, if there's no reward associated with listening to music, that music therapy wouldn't be recommended for that person. I would agree, yeah. 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 Just, I mean, to give people a, a background, Ra Rachel has done a lot more music perception and cognition than probably most most um, most listeners, but musical anhedonia is this fairly recently coined term for people who don't find music to be rewarding at all. Um, so the, the, these are not people, for example, with depression, right? So they they enjoy long walks on the beach, they enjoy good food, they enjoy uh, money as much as anybody else, uh, but it's just music that they don't find to be rewarding. Uh, and we've come across some cases like that, and, and we've shown that uh, they have differences in brain connectivity between auditory areas and the centers for emotion and reward, especially for reward processing in their brains. Um, I think that I, I would agree um, that that it's not likely that music therapy would work, especially um, especially receptive music therapy, right? For for active music therapy, who knows, right? Maybe they they are able to complete a, a melody, and and that might still be rewarding for some other reasons. But um, but I, I think that we're still in very early stages um, to answer that question. But but my gut feeling would be the same that that it probably wouldn't work if music just doesn't doesn't engage you. Yeah, if I could just jump in here, I think this is an important question because um, you, you can sort of think of it as a spectrum. Anhedonia, musical anhedonia, lack of pleasure in music is sort of an extreme, um, but then there's variation along the spectrum in how strongly people respond to music. So you might ask, are you a strong music responder or a weak music responder? And can we quantify that? Because that might be useful to know if somebody is going to be going into music therapy. Um, and we, Psyche and I have a colleague in Toronto, Dr. Frank Russo, who's developed a simple questionnaire called Absorption in Music Scale, or AIMS, AIMS, the AIMS scale. It's about 30 questions um, that just ask you things like, when you hear a piece of music that you really love, do you stop doing what you're doing just to listen to it? So it's all about how committed you become to music that really engages you, um, sort of cognitively and emotionally. And it turns out your score on this simple question and answer scale, where you rate your you know, one to five uh, answers, how strongly music absorbs you in these different ways uh, can predict your physiological responses to music in stressful situations. Um, so that could be, you know, relevant for, for example, trying to decide if this is a person that will respond strongly uh, to music in an emotional way or somebody that's less likely to be responsive. And so kind of the idea of quantifying how much of a music responder you are might be a useful uh, thing where music therapy and music neuroscience could come together to try and understand why some people are more strong responders than other in terms of brain structure or function and then what that means in terms of what the right music therapy to use for them would be. Okay, uh, Rachel, thank you very much for participating. I appreciate that. Now, if we had a prize for stumping the moderator, Anhedonia would certainly go to you this evening, but I will remember that for next <laughs> month. Okay, 
Next, Rook LaMonica asks, does recorded music have a similar effect as live music for use with music therapy? I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, I guess for me in my experience as a music therapist, um, recorded music is very useful, but live music where I can match and give what I see my clients need in the moment musically, um, that, that can't be matched with recorded music always. Um, I really do feel strongly that live music can be extremely effective um, in therapy. There was Excellent. a paper, uh, there's actually not yet a paper, this is very new, not yet even published, but um, so we have a colleague, um, Molly Henry, who is now in, in Germany, but th this work was done in, in um, Hamilton, Ontario, where the live lab, is that where the That's live right. lab yep. is? Yeah. yeah. Um, they, um, they recruited, so they, they have this beautiful concert hall uh, at McMaster University where um, you can go to a concert and have your brain waves recorded at the same time. And you can also um, record simultaneously the performer's brain waves at the same time. Um, so then, they, so these researchers hired a band. They got the band to um, to play uh, with MIDI music, right? And, and so they recorded the MIDI output of what every instrument was do, doing very precisely. Uh, and so they had they, they did this performance with a live audience. And then they recorded everything and then they played it back audio visual um, with uh, another audience. So live versus a perfect replica, but not live. Um, and then it turned out that people reported enjoying the live performance more. Um, and then also people's brain waves, um, especially delta frequencies were more synchronized um, in during the live performance. So I definitely would agree that live is better. But without live, like in COVID, then we'll opt for the next best thing, right? <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, now, can a patient in a coma benefit from music therapy? And what is the therapist's and neuroscience evidence? Uh, <laughs> I would jump in. Um, I, I feel like Please. I would... I would I would like to say yes. Um, we do know that there's a lot of research on the physiological effects that music has on the body. Um, we've we've read lots of research on like music therapy reducing um, lowering blood pressure and improving a patient's respiration, um, and they're um, having like an improved cardiac output. Um, we in hospitals, music and medicine you know, reducing their heart rate and, um, you know, all those kind of physiological effects on the body. Um, and that obviously differs patient to patient, but I would like to think that those physical effects would still be taking place when a person is in a coma. <laughs> So I, I did my um, internship at Shriners Burn Hospital. So in Boston, I worked with a lot of um, patients that were in a great deal of pain um, and some were in medically induced comas to help um, during their treatment. Um, and I got to watch their heart rate monitor and I would, using the ISO principle, match where they were as far as how fast their heart heart rate was was or how fast heavy their breathing was. And then I would slowly play my music slower, maybe softer, less intense. And over time, I could see their breathing be more regulated, um, less sporadic. I could see their heart rate go down. So I definitely think um, that even in a coma, music can reach. Okay, well, along that topic, Lisa Wong has asked for the music therapists, how have you pivoted during the pandemic and the quarantine? Do you want to go first? <laughs> um, sure. So I, I guess um, it has been 
a struggle for me. I really love seeing my clients in person. Um, it's it's a different feel. You can read them so much easier, um, which is so funny now that I'm doing more telehealth. So I'm 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 doing sessions virtually. Um, Prior to the pandemic, I thought I sometimes I wanted to turn my face into an iPad so my client would attend more. Um, but now I don't feel that way. I feel like I'm in the iPad and it's 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 not as easy as I thought it might be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same. It's just it's really heartbreaking to not be able to be in person with all of our clients. Um, I think that, um, you know, I had strongly stressed the importance of the therapeutic relationship. And it's very different when you are um, virtual, when you're looking at people through a screen. It just there's really nothing that can um, replace that in person, um, in person therapy. Um, we, uh, you know, we moved pretty quickly into teletherapy for most of our clients um, and for um, a lot of our memory care um, residents at several um, assisted living facilities. But um, yeah, it, it, it was just like a learning curve for all of our therapists to be able to um, navigate. I've, I've definitely seen that um, some of our clients were were not appropriate for teletherapy, so their services are on hold for the time being um, until um, they are either comfortable being in person one on one, or um, or until you know this kind of threat is um, much more minimalized than um, than it is today. And um, but for those that have um, that we've been doing teletherapy for, it's been it's been benefiting them, and we have been able to measure their therapeutic progress um, to, to a similar degree. I'll just that's really important, I think. And I'll just jump in here. I think one of the big differences between online musical experiences Ella, and in person live musical experiences is uh, singing and um, singing together something that people love to do. Uh, just a very natural thing we see all over the world. Um, and it's really hard online. Zoom is, in, is impossible for trying to sing together. Um, so I know this is a science cafe. So if there are programmers out there who are looking for an interesting and relevant public health issue to tackle with their skills, making software that people can actually sing together online would be an amazing thing because people feel a connection through singing that they don't often get in other ways and they're yearning for it and the current technology just doesn't support it. So uh, there's a real need for that. Oh, great, thanks. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> Marissa, do you want to add more? Oh, no, I just, I agree. It's That's been one okay. of the biggest challenges is, is even doing on Zoom, two people talking at the same time can't happen. So two people trying to make music at the same time is, we need better software. Yeah, especially right. since, singing is one of the most high risk behaviors in terms of real life singing with others because you're standing near them expelling tons of air. Mm -hmm. And uh, not a good thing to be doing from a health perspective right now, but if you could sing together online and in a way that was temporally coordinated without delays and thing, it would be wonderful. Great, uh, yeah, I've had the opposite experience singing with people, they generally turn around and say, would you please not do that? <laughs> Next question. What role does does music play in the development of a healthy individual? And are there trends in behavioral or brain brain differences for these growing those growing up with music versus those who don't? That's a big question. Yeah. It's a bunch um, of questions. <laughs> yes. Um, Ani, do you want to start with that one? Sure. I'll first start. I'll just start by saying, great question. Um, but it's also very hard to find people that grow up without music at all. Uh, so comparing the brains, it's a super interesting kind of thought question. What would the brains differences be between somebody who grew up with music and somebody who grew up without music? But it's very hard to find people that don't hear music and experience music and engage with it in some way. Um, but it's a very important question because it it relates to how we can help people that have certain neurological disorders. And uh, that's where there is a lot of research and 
So some of the work I've done has to do with how um, young children's rhythmic abilities relate to their language abilities, including what are called phonological abilities, the ability to break words into their component sounds and manipulate them, which is a key part of learning how to read. And uh, we published a study showing that in kindergartners, there are significant relationships between non-linguistic rhythmic abilities. Uh, can you tell the difference between these two rhythms, for example, and these early uh, phonological abilities that will then become important for language and re uh, for reading. And the significance of that is that if you have a kid that's at risk for dyslexia, where phonological processing is a real problem, um, maybe you could use rhythm, rhythmic training, which for them is just kind of fun and games, uh, to enhance aspects of their language processing through these connections in the brain that will put them on a better path for their reading development. So there is more and more research like that, where you look at um, how develop how certain musical uh, interventions uh, change development of the brain in ways that affect other important cognitive functions like language. And it looks like there are these connections, which is very exciting and I think has real implications for music therapy as well. Okay, yeah, there's great. been quite, uh, I think it's so right. It's so true that we're hard pressed to find anyone who doesn't have music um, in 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 the on Earth, um, but there are a few labs that have studied that done longitudinal studies on music training um, versus other kinds of training. So, for example, sports or or painting, like visual art, um, and I think the sports findings really are striking to me. Um, where um, so definitely you get the phonological and you get the, the auditory gains um, when you have musical training uh, as, as a child. Um, and you find that quite early on, within a year of musical training, you start to see all these brain differences. Um, but then there are some other gains that are more um, social, emotional in nature. Um, so a really lovely finding, this is from our, um, Asal Habibi and, and her group in the University of Southern um, California, and what they showed was that, um, do you guys know the marshmallow task, right? Where you you give uh, kids a marshmallow and you say, if you can wait for four minutes, then you get two marshmallows. Um, so they adapted that to, to I think it's M&Ms, um, but and th they adapted that to see how long children were willing to wait to get uh, a bigger reward. Uh, and it turns out that children who had musical training waited longer. Um, so this is a really striking result that um, shows you that it's not, it definitely there's something about um, visual, uh, auditory processing and, and phonological processing. But then I think somewhat beyond that, there's some social and emotional gains as well. Oh, great. Um, the next question is from Raj Burton Patel. What are your top of the head thoughts on which field of clinical therapy can be most advanced by music in reaching beyond the effects of medicine? Hmm. Um, what a great question. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Raj Burden for Hell's dad should uh, take that one. <laughs> um, uh, well, actually, I, I talk to him a lot. So why don't we hear uh, from the music therapist? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Um, I guess I'm I'm curious. Um, it's hard for them to kind of elaborate on the question, um, but when they say what field of clinical therapy, um, what they're meaning by that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure I answer it. I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's like which branch of um, of medicine could be most advanced by using music in addition to just regular medicine. Yeah. I mean, I think if that if that's the question, I would say it's just it's really individualized to the person. Music therapy isn't a good fit for everyone. Um, it it can be it can be beneficial to many people, but it it really is individualized. So. Um, Maybe I, I, can, I can, can I rephrase? Okay, Roger, I hope you don't mind if I rephrase. <laughs> so, so who? Let's understand your your ecosystem, right? Um, so, Marissa and Elizabeth, like, do, 
who calls you? Is it the family members that call you or do, do is a psychiatrist or a neurologist who, who call for a music therapy? Like at, at what point do you, uh, who are the different constituents of medical practice that you interface with? The family. Uh-huh. Or the individual client. We work with a lot of adults. So um, it could be just the person themselves. Um, a lot of times they'll give us their, um, we request permission to um, collaborate with other providers if they have any other providers. So um, if our clients are working with a speech therapist, if they're working with a neurologist, if they're working with an OT, we will collaborate with them because we all want our clients to be um, working towards the same goals in all of whatever they're doing. So, um, right. but, we, but we mostly consult with a client first. Yeah. I wonder what, I wonder if either of you um, could talk about uh, cancer therapy, because I've heard that, um, you know, music obviously is not going to cure cancer, but it, it's been very effective in helping cancer patients cope with yeah. what they're going through with chemo and uh, the changes in their life. Um, and that's, one branch of clinical therapy that seems to be really can be powerfully uh, benefited by bringing music into the experience of going through it. Um, do you have experience with that, Marissa or Elizabeth? I personally don't. Um, one of our team members at the Sonatina Center does work at the Seacoast Cancer Center, providing patients with music therapy, individual music therapy sessions while they're receiving their infusion treatment. Um, mm -hmm. and we've gotten really positive feedback from both the patients and also from the staff. Hmm. Um, uh, the nursing and the doctors um, have commented on um, just the music therapist being there, there being an improved positive attitude among the staff members, oh. um, which kind of makes them, you know, everyone kind of is more positive and it, it improves care treatment overall. That's so interesting. So you're not just affecting the, the, the person that has the problem you're affecting the whole team yeah caring for the person that's really interesting i also wonder what the differences are between private practice and uh a music therapist who is working in uh, let's say a hospital right like the the environment must be quite different because i i think um like i've been speaking with uh, speech language pathologists and, and music therapists in and also um, physical therapists and occupational therapists and neurologists. And it seems like they, there's quite a, a, a wonderful multidisciplinary team where um, one, um, let's say a neurologist could call on different um, specialists to administer therapy, depending on what the neurologist thinks might be receptive um, by the patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Suzanne Hanser. What are some of the strongest outcomes that you have seen with regards to the impact of music or music therapy? <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> um, oh, so many. Elizabeth, do you have anything that's jumping out at you like that you want to share? I mean, like examples of, of breakthroughs with clients. Is that kind of what she's asking? I think so. Um, yeah. One of my most memorable moments with a client was a young boy who um, had, he was, he had failure to thrive. And so he was maybe about a year and a half to two years um, older than when he, he should have hit the milestone of crawling. Um, and overworking with him, he really loved the guitar. And so I, we were working on reaching and strumming the guitar when it was his turn in the song. And then over months, I was able to go farther away. So then eventually he had to lean forward and then on all fours. And then eventually he, he took his first crawl in front of his grandmother to, to be able to strum the guitar. Um, so that was one of my most momentous moments with a client as far as um, how effective music therapy was for them. Um, okay, um, so Marissa, 
Uh, and Elizabeth, could you just walk us through what a, a session looks like? Somebody from the family contacts you and says they need some help. And so I'm, I'm trying to, in my mind, imagine what the process is like once you actually meet your patient. What happens? Um, so we get a referral. Um, it could be from maybe a, a special ed director. It can be from um, a counselor. It can be from a family member. Um, it could be even from a case manager at an area service agency. Uh, references can come from anywhere. Um, and so after that, then we do conduct a formal assessment. Um, then that's where we gather information like our baseline um, and then after that, we will create a treatment plan and then hopefully implement the treatment plan and over time assess and reevaluate um, to make sure we're working on the goals. As far as what a typical session would look like, um, I guess for me, I work mostly with school age children and early intervention. So I'm going to always create a safe container that's the way I do that is I would start with a hello or a greeting song and end with a goodbye or farewell song. And in between, we're using music, um, whether we're singing or dancing or moving, um, and we're using visuals um, to, to work on, on a lot of um, academic and developmental goals. Great. Marissa, same thing? Yeah, we have a similar process. So our referrals would come in and um, we do a consult first to kind of, it's a little bit of a get to know you interview to um, kind of talk about the, the process of music therapy with our potential client and see if they feel like they're a good fit, um, you know, answer any questions that they might have about music therapy. Um, and from there, we do schedule a music therapy evaluation. Um, it's really a lot of, it's a more formal process if we're doing it for um, a school district and it's for an IEP. Um, and then um, it's really individualized um, for the clients that come into our center. Um, and from there, we kind of, if it's a child's patient, then we do a lot of um, question questionnaire type interview with the parent guardian or whoever the child's close caregivers are so that we can really get a sense of what um, what they're really looking to benefit, um, what, what, how they want to benefit from music therapy. Um, because there's a number of different broad goals that we can work on. We can work on social skills. We can work on expressive and receptive communication or fine and gross motor, but it's really kind of where the, um, you know, where the family is seeing, um, you know, what, what do they really want their child to be able to do to the, are they just looking um, for their child to have a really positive self uh, sense of self identity, um, then we can work on that. So really, that's, um, that's an important part of the evaluation process. And then for adult clients, um, they we involve them in the planning of their treatment. Um, so you know, asking them, like, what do you what are you hoping to seek out of your therapy with us? Um, and then we kind of write up our treatment plan with a mix of what we've gained from the, the evaluation where we're focusing on what their strengths are. Um, that's usually the evaluation is when we find out what their music preferences are. Um, you know, we, we already talked about how important the preferences are um, and, you know, their cultural background, um, any historical context that's going to be relevant to therapy, um, uh, their family systems. Um, all of that. So we're kind of all taking that all into into context for the treatment. And then um, we just start seeing the client and some clients come once a week. I have a client that comes three times a week and I have a client that comes once a month. So it's really, again, really individualized to the person. Oh, okay. Thanks for that. Um, carrying on with that answer, what are the differences based on society, Western Eastern African in the use of music therapy. Hmm. Um, I mean, it almost just what I just said was, you know, it's just so individualized. We, you know, taking somebody's cultural background into um, consideration when um, when working with them is is part of the process of the intake and learning about that person and what their goals will be. Okay, uh, I think we are all set with our questions. I'm checking the time. It's a little after eight, so 
Um, if there are any final questions, get them in now. Otherwise, I think we are all set. Um, I want to go ahead and thank the panel. That was excellent. Uh, the, again, the whole basis for the Science Cafes is having the audience ask great questions and have the educational experience of hearing from the experts. And I, I think you guys were wonderful this evening. So this session is complete. Thank you so much for being here. You are very generous with your time and your expertise. I certainly appreciate it. And now we will go off and please join me in thanking the panel. And Scott, Thank you, take it away. Thanks, guys. Our oh, pleasure. Mm. Oh, uh, thanks, Rick. Great conversation. We'll see you all next month. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, the link from this evening's event will be posted both on the Facebook page and also on our Science Cafe New Hampshire YouTube page. So you may watch it in the future. And I'd just like to remind everybody that it takes a team to make this happen and thank all the people behind the scenes. If you'd like to support what we're doing, you can follow the link on our screen or visit our website at www.sciencecafenh.org. Until next month, thanks for being here.